Hello. Uh, welcome to the Flying Focus 19th bus anniversary. I'm PC Perry, a founding member of the Flying Focus Video Collective. We started producing video as a tool for social change in 1991 when some of us came together during the so-called Gulf War, Part 1. We've been covering activists, speakers, visionaries, forums, street protests, and other hard-to-find information ever since. And hi, I'm Dan Handelman. I'm also a co-founding member of Flying Focus. Uh, we keep doing the show because the corporate media doesn't examine the issues of war and peace, economic and environmental justice, from a balanced point of view. So we try to provide some of that balance. The Flying Focus video bus premiered on November 18, 1991. Uh, this show marks 19 years of our half-hour weekly program. Tonight you'll hear from some of our volunteer producers and videographers about the 14 shows, which are made up of 25 episodes, that we produced between November 2009 and October 2010. They'll play short clips from these programs and explain something about the shows. Making TV isn't just for corporations. You can do it too. We post some of our video clips on the internet, www.flyingfocus.org, but plenty of people still watch television. Wouldn't you like to do it too? If you want to get involved, you can call us at 503-239-7456 or 503-321-5051, or you can write to us at ffvc at flyingfocus.org. Hi again, PC here. I've been with Flying Focus since the start. We started in 1991. This year I captured video for eight of the 14 shows you'll be seeing, all of them edited by Barb Green. We joined the group in uh, 1995. Uh, and here is where we are now. Hi. Um, yeah, so this next clip we're going to see is uh, Mia McDonald from the World Watch Institute talking about um, data that shows whether it's more beneficial for the environment to eat a plant-based diet mm -hmm. or to um, change your mode of transportation which is something that people don't think about too much, and it's pretty interesting. Let's take a look. Yeah. Here we are back to the idea of burgers and cars and seeing how they um, add up. So as a couple of the other speakers noted, livestock operations currently emit 18% of total greenhouse gases in the world. That's nearly one-fifth of the total. So that is, that is very significant. Now, in terms of comparing that to cars, transportation, that is more than all the greenhouse gases from the world's transportation system. So that's private vehicles, public transit, which I know you have excellent public transit here in Portland, and airplanes. All of that, think of all the billions of people in the world on the moon, all of that comes out to only 14%. So we see the livestock sector is a, is a big player in the global environment and in the climate crisis that we are basically all confronting. Okay, and I just want to break down this data a little bit. So the 18% that impact on greenhouse gases, the share of carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas we hear the most about generally, it's not enormous, although it is nearly 10% of the global total, so around 9%. Uh, most of that is from land changes, so again, from deforestation to make way for cattle, for feed crops. But if we look at these other two gases that the UN report did a very good job of uh, quantifying their impacts, methane. So about 37% of global methane comes from livestock. Now I put digestive processes here, uh, belching, passing wind, other things that are related to the di digestive processes, primarily of cattle, bison, hooved animals, but not solely that, but primarily it is those uh, kinds of farmed animals. Now the thing that's quite astonishing about this is methane is 23 times as powerful in terms of its global warming impact as carbon dioxide. So even though we mainly hear about reducing our carbon footprint, and that's certainly essential, methane is a far more potent global warming gas. And then if we just look down at nitrous oxide, so 65% of the nitrous oxide emitted into the atmosphere comes from livestock production. That's mostly from manure that is spread on fields, sometimes makes its way into waterways um, where nitrogen turns into nitrous oxide. Now that gas is nearly 300 times as potent as carbon dioxide. We just uh, watched a clip about uh, food or cars 
And now we're going to talk about electric cars. Uh, what did you call this program? Um, this is from the Better Living Show. It's kind of a home and garden show for uh -huh. uh, that benefits the environment. Um, and this is Tim Kutcher, who's a uh, board member of the Oregon Electric Vehicle Association, right. um, who's got a lot of experience working with electric cars and has some good information here. Listen carefully. The cost to run an electric vehicle is quite inexpensive. It's between one and two cents per mile. So the actual cost is quite inexpensive compared to the cost of gasoline. It costs, for my particular electric vehicle, um, it costs me about $20 a month, and that's using renewable energy from windmills and solar. Um, costs me about $20 a month on my electric bill to go about 900 miles. So I, uh, a lot of people have concerns about like where is that electricity coming from? Is it coming from coal plants? Is that really polluting? And uh, it is polluting, and I will offer the caveat that electric vehicles, because they're far more efficient than gasoline vehicles, that the emissions from the coal plants is actually half of the, uh, between a half and a third of those of a typical gasoline vehicle. So even though you are getting dirty coal electricity, you're actually putting less greenhouse gases out into the atmosphere. Our second question, if I'm right, is um, uh, the cost of the materials to make the car itself. Uh, how do you address to skeptics where that uh, cost um, comes from? How, how, is that very expensive? Who winds up paying that? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question about the cost of materials for the car. So in an electric vehicle, the cost of materials for the shell and all the rest of the car is the same as it is for a gasoline vehicle. So there's really not much of a change there. Uh, the cool thing about, for example, what our, our organization is trying to encourage, we're trying to encourage conversion of existing vehicles such that you don't actually have to pay for that additional materials cost. You're using an existing vehicle, maybe with a blown engine, or after 300,000 miles, maybe the engine is died and now you can drop out the gasoline engine, put an electric motor into the car and give it another 500,000 miles of useful life. When a lead acid battery dies, it's existing technology that has been around for 150 years. There's actually a lot of recycling facilities out there that process 99% of the battery and get 99% of that battery back into circulation. With lithium ion batteries, first of all, the batteries last a lot longer, but in addition, uh, they're still working out the recycling process for lithium ion. So when the lithium ion batteries die, um, I, at this point in time, about 50% of the battery gets recycled back into the industrial stream. This clip is from the program you call um, Smaller Footprint from the um, Better Living Show. Um, no, this one isn't from the, the Better Living Show. This is the one... Um, where this is my own personal quest for oh, right. a smaller footprint, a smaller carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And in this particular clip, we're taking a look at electric bikes. Um, so let's take a look at that. Actually, about a third of the bikes I sell are daily commuters, mm -hmm. which is a huge number for any shop. Um, that people who are looking at these, they're looking at their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And what, what it, my main customer, the main, core, the main common factor, is they have cognitive dissonance when they turn the ignition in their car. Mm -hmm. There's something that says, I'm not living my values the way I want to. I need to live my values more. Right. And there's a bit of pain associated with that. And so they're looking for ways to live their values more fully. Mm -hmm. um, in the industry, there's a lot of hype. And there are a lot of people saying that the e-bikes can do all sorts of things. And when, I, when someone comes in, you can tell if they've been bitten by the hype or not. And so part of the unfortunate part of what we do is try to create realistic approaches mm. to people. And it, my favorite customers are not ones that come in and buy on impulse whatsoever. Mm. Using an electric bike is a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. It's about hopping on a bike rather than getting in a car to go to the grocery store. It's about hopping on the bike and going to school or to work. And it involves thinking things through to a point. Um, it's challenging to get a car. Cars are so convenient. You hop in it, they've got their own little climate. They've got their safety bubble. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you have your own radio. I mean, all different things. And so thinking through, what does it take to get out of that car and to find a way which promotes more personal, environmental, and geopolitical health? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're looking for. And that's what I believe e-bikes help to solve. Combining biking with uh, mass transit. Yes. Um, and I found that 
my bike, the Beria, has a longer wheelbase yeah. and doesn't fit well on the front of the uh, buses. That's true. Um, so are all of the bikes like that or? Some are, some aren't. Um, anytime your Beery is also a crank forward design. Any crank forward bike is going to have a longer frame. What's crank forward? Crank forward means that you have a longer chain and you have the ability to put your feet flat when you come uh -huh. up to a stoplight. Um, and so any of those are going to be too long for the little box on the front of a bus. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the bikes will fit and some of them won't. Um, what is kind of neat about an electric bike is there are very few spots in town where you can get there faster by using the bus mm -hmm. than you can just by going. I'm starting to realize that. And you're not uncommon in terms of people who want to ride their bike more looking to an electric bike to get them where they want to go. Mm -hmm. I have one customer who's lost 62 pounds. Mm. Um, bigger guy, I had to make custom wheels for him, but boy, he rides it absolutely everywhere. Uh -huh. And so he's lost weight even using the electric bike. Yes, you still get exercise. You're Hi, I'm Dan again, and I'm gonna show you a couple of clips from two shows that I did this year around Hiroshima Day events that happen every year down at Waterfront Park here in Portland, uh, sponsored by Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, or PSR, and they do this every year and bring up issues around war and peace and social justice and what happens when people have nuclear weapons and what happens with nuclear power, uh, particularly the nuclear power plants that have been in this area for a long time in the Portland area. So uh, first we're going to take a look at the clips from the 2009 Hiroshima Day. Uh, and we start with a, um, a clip from a young woman with PSU's uh, United Nations Association. And she talks about how young people can get involved. Uh, we hear about, from a man from Iran who uh, is in the news a lot about nuclear power these days, uh, from a, a poet uh, called Polo and from a woman storyteller who's telling the story of the thousand cranes. For the last year, I've enjoyed the privilege of serving as an officer of the Model United Nations. My colleagues and I have strived to inspire the younger generations, spark their desire to get educated and be able to take a stand on some rather complicated issues that we are faced with today. Issues like nuclear disarmament. There are people here today that have paved the way for this movement and we must keep those torches lit. Progress is completely dependent upon succession. President Obama I fully support that he is, uh, he wishes for a, uh, a, a nuclear free zone in the Middle East. And that is really the, the best thing that anybody in the world can uh, dream for. But the realities on the ground, unfortunately, is, uh, is, is otherwise. And as I said, because of the existence of nuclear uh, weapons, uh, many of them in Israel, Pakistan, and India, some of these awful human episodes we memorialize with elegant statuary, some with grave marble structures, some we don't. Not at all. But whether we honor families' losses or not, whether our perished are remembered or not, every place of great horror gives life deep pain. Personal and collective and spiritual pain. Ask anyone. Those of us in the bamboo class, we folded 356 cranes so Sadako could be buried with her 1,000 cranes. And in Hiroshima now, there is a memorial to Sadako holding her golden crane up into the air. And at the base of the statue, it says, This is our prayer. This is our cry. Peace on Earth. And now we're going to see some clips from this year's uh, Hiroshima Day event, 2010. Uh, they feature Representative Jules Bailey from Southeast Portland, who's on the Hanford Cleanup Board. Uh, a man named Danny, who's with the SGI, an international Buddhist organization. And a woman who was a survivor of Hiroshima. And she talks very movingly about what it was like to be in Japan when the bombs were dropping during World War II. 
And then Dr. Fran Storrs from PSR, who kind of gives people an inspiring talk about what you can do to get involved. We have to make choices about where our energy comes from, how we invest our resources, what we choose to build, because what we build is in many parts a reflection of who we are. Do we continue to build bombs, or do we continue to build healthy minds and healthy children and healthy schools? I have the honor of serving on the Hanford Cleanup Board. It is a bi-state agency uh, board that is, uh, oversees the cleanup of what is the worst uh, environmental disaster in the Western Hemisphere. For those of you that haven't had a chance to go out to Hanford, uh, Polo talked about the confluence of the rivers behind us, the Willamette and Columbia. The worst environmental catastrophe in the Western Hemisphere sits just upriver on the Columbia and flows downwards to us. And it is that that is the legacy of our nuclear weapons program. But this is a matter of far too much importance. The fate of humankind literally hangs in the balance. It cannot be left up to a handful of government policymakers. The movements for treaties banning landmines and cluster munitions were driven not by politicians, but by ordinary people like you and me. People whose sense of humanity was outraged by the horrific nature of these weapons, whose sense of urgency was propelled by the need to prevent further suffering. In the same way, when ordinary people understand how important a nuclear weapons convention is, we will see another powerful groundswell in international public opinion emerge. On 29th of June, 1945, the city of Okayama was bombed by 138 B-29s. They dropped 15,000 firebombs and destroyed 75% of the city. Just overnight, I lost 25% of my classmates. Only a day before, I played with my best friend and we promised each other that we would play again the following day. But the following day never came to us. I'm still waiting for her to show up with a big smile on her face. By being here tonight, you are part of a growing movement for nuclear abolition and by taking action here and getting involved with PSR and our many partner organizations, you can be part of creating a nuclear free future. We did some programs on gentrification in Northeast Portland. Um, this is something that Barb edited, I ran camera on. Uh, tell me what we have in this one, Barb. Um, yeah, so this is a little change from the uh, environmental programming. This is Carl Talton, who's a very long-term uh, Portlander, talking about his experiences. And he uh, has a lot of experience with the Portland Development Commission and um, how things have changed in the various neighborhoods. Um, this is a very interesting clip here um, that shows the Albina plan and a lot of people with really great intentions mm -hmm. that didn't go so well. If you've been here for 15 years, you know what this community looked like 15 years ago. Lots of vacant, abandoned uh, houses and buildings. Uh, there was absolutely nothing on Alberta. You know, a couple of storefronts that were uh, that were barely holding their own, but for the most part they were vacant. People were willing to give you the property if you just take over the taxes or pay the taxes on it. Uh, 15, I think it were 15,000 vacant or abandoned homes right in inner north northeast mm -hmm. Portland. Uh, gang activity was really starting mm -hmm. to crank up at that time. Uh, uh, on an early transition in a job, one of the first things that I, I did was to meet with chief of police, the, the police chief of uh, uh, the fire department and the mayor to shut down uh, a section of inner north northeast Portland so the police could come through and sweep and drive the gates out. Uh, that's now the Maya Angelou, at least it was, I assume it's still called the Maya Angelou project. So, it, so things were, were not, not pretty then. So after all of this planning, after resources coming in, after any CDC was starting to build housing and all these things were happening, we said, well, let's, um, let's take a look at the community and see how well we've done. So the windshield survey was pretty good, you know, just like now. Northeast looks pretty good. So we thought, well, maybe we give ourselves a A minus or B plus or something like that. And then we said, well, let's scratch the surface a little bit because, you know, when we sat down and put this together, 
that was a particular population that we had in mind that we wanted to benefit from all of this, you know, activity that was going to be coming on, all this planning. And when we did that, uh, it, it dropped to like a D, mm -hmm. uh, at best a C minus, because clearly uh, the the changes, the physical changes we wanted to see took place. The changes with the population here that we wanted to see did not happen, or at least they did not happen to the benefit of the people who were here. So the Alliance, uh, while it was a, uh, a great organizer and a great contributor and really put some things in motion, uh, today continues to struggle to really kind of revisit and really bring uh, back into the mix, the community that that whole thing was put together to serve. PC Perry here with Daniel Webb, and uh, he's been with us about 10 years, is that right? That's right. Uh, what will you show us tonight as your clip? This is a talk from late 2009 by Paul Cienfuegos at the E-Convergence. Paul Cienfuegos is a social activist and founder of Democracy Unlimited of Humboldt County, an organization working for social change, educating people to use the ballot and the courts to prevent corporations from exerting undue influence over public policy. In this clip from late 2009, Cienfuegos discusses how the relationship between corporations and government has evolved. What is the biggest hurdle that stops we Americans from knowing how powerful we really are? I think it's that we don't know our own history, and thus we don't know what the proper relationship is between we the people and our state and federal governments, as defined in the nation's founding documents, that we are the sovereign people with defined rights, and our government exists to serve us and has defined responsibilities to us. And the proper relationship between we the people and our chartered corporations, that they exist, at least they are historically existed, to serve specific public needs and to cause no harm and that it's really not as big a stretch as you might believe to reclaim this history and make it ours again. Here's the six minute version of the three hour history lesson that I offer in my workshops. The American Revolution was an anti-corporate rule revolution against monarchs in Europe and the crown corporations that they installed in this new country. You may not have learned this in school, but it's true. The nation's founders redefined what a corporation was, transforming them from power holders to subordinate legal entities, chartered one at a time by their respective state legislatures with a life of usually 10 to 30 years, and legally defined with great care so that they would be required to each fulfill one specific social need and cause no harm. If they violated either of these norms, the corporation was frequently dissolved, its assets seized, and distributed back to its stockholders or to those who had been harmed. And sometimes its directors were jailed. But that's not all. There were many more rules designed to ensure that a corporation as a legal thing was kept on a very short leash. That does it for part one of the 19th bus anniversary. We are PC Perry and Daniel Webb of Flying Focus. Also here in the studio tonight are Alan, Margarita, Jen and Moss back in the booth. If you want to get involved and or support Flying Focus in any way, call us at 503-239-7456 or check for showtimes at 503-321-5051. You can write to us at ffvc at flyingfocus.org. Flying Focus is an all-volunteer group whose funding comes from individual donors and video orders. We can use your help, so write down those numbers and give us a call. Be sure you encourage your cable company and the local officials to continue funding community access and to keep the alternative voices in the mix of what gets piped into people's homes. Thanks for watching and tune in next week at this same time for part two.